Hey y'all, and welcome back to Flick Connection, where in less time than you normally spend scrolling for something to watch, I'm gonna tell you about 20 of the absolute best sci-fi movies you can currently catch included with Prime Video. That's right, all these movies are included with your Prime Video subscription, or at least they are for now. Most of them will expire, and they're not available all over the world, but I've listed places you can stream these in other countries like Canada, the UK, Australia, down in the top pinned comment, along with the full list of all the titles discussed in this video. But my number 20 pick is a low budget banger that actually reminded me a lot of the video game Portal. It's actually titled Infinity Chamber, and right off the bat, you can tell where the low budget comes in. A man wakes up trapped inside a room and essentially has to figure out how to get out. This also reminded me a little bit of the 90s horror movie Cube, but this is much more of a mind-bending thriller than it is a horror movie. In fact, there are a bunch of flashbacks and even sort of a love story that develops, so there's a lot of meat on the bone with this movie, even though it's a fairly low-budget sci-fi effort, which are rarely excellent. Infinity Chamber just happens to be the exception to that rule. Next up, we've got an even lower budget sci-fi effort, but this is actually a sci-fi comedy that is directed by horror royalty, Bruce Campbell. It also stars Bruce Campbell and the man with the screaming brain. We're getting the snot beat out of us. This is because you fight like a girl. Correction, we fight like a girl. <laughs> man with the screaming brain. This is a movie where you get exactly what you would expect. It is a cheesy, old-fashioned, drive-in style sci-fi movie done for little to no money, but it's very self-aware. Bruce Campbell is excellent, and it's also kind of cool that he directed the thing. You either need to be an exceptionally adventurous viewer to check this one out, or just a fan of Bruce Campbell and the Evil Dead movies or anything else he's done, because this fits right in that wheelhouse. But my number 18 pick gets significantly more serious with another low budget, under the radar sci fi flick titled Level 16. Now, this too is a bit of a mind bender. It's hard to tell what exactly is going on from the start. In fact, you spend most of the movie trying to figure out the reality of the situation of these young girls in level 16. Because obviously you've got a bunch of young girls trapped inside some sort of facility where they're being controlled, and it's hard to tell if it's in their best interest or if there's something more sinister going on, and as you would guess, it's, it's something sinister. But this movie's not nearly as off-putting as the concept might allude to. It's actually fairly accessible, especially if you want kind of a mystery movie. This one leans much harder on the mystery aspect than it does sci-fi. Now, my number 17 pick has a significantly bigger budget than some of the other movies discussed so far, but it did flop at the box office, and I think it was kind of undeserved. But I mention it here to hopefully resurrect The Lazarus Project. Now, this is sort of a by-the-book PG-13 horror flick. It's not too scary, fairly predictable, but it does have a very interesting sci-fi setup about these scientists trying to bring someone back from the dead which is something you've seen before in horror movies. I mean, that's what Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is, but The Lazarus Project has an interesting take on it, and I think it was fairly well delivered. In fact, had this been a lower budget movie, which it easily could have been, there's not even that many effects in this thing, but if they went with an unknown cast, this movie might have done much better than packing a bunch of B-level stars into it that nobody really cared to see, or at least all of them were when this movie came out. Next up, we've got a somewhat heartwarming sci-fi flick. There aren't many or really any more of those on this list, but Robot and Frank actually stars Frank Langlia as an ex-jewel thief who's retired, living alone, getting on in his years, and his children gift him a companion robot, something that is on the horizon for humanity much closer than it was back when this movie came out making Robot and Frank much less of a science fiction movie than almost anything else on this list. But as you might expect, Frank being an ex-jewel thief, he kind of starts to get the itch and now he's got this new robot companion that could maybe help him out. And even though that setup sounds almost like a silly children's movie, it's really not. Like I said, this is a somewhat heartwarming flick that does have some moments of tension, but it's mostly kind of a nice, easy watch. And I do think it's one that will appeal mostly to older viewers, mainly just because of the themes. They deal a lot with, you know, kind of having a last hurrah. 
real quick before talking about the rest of the movies on this list. If you've had your eye on this shirt, I designed it, or at least I came up with the idea and my wife designed it, and we did a bunch over at darrenvandam.com slash shop. I'll put a link in the description, but it's very easy to find. Like I said, there's a bunch of new designs over there. Order by December 10th if you want to guarantee to get it before Christmas time, or go check out the designs and maybe send one of them to someone who needs a good gift idea for you. They're fairly inexpensive and super soft and comfortable. We actually tested a bunch of different shirts to make sure we got one that is just great for every day use. I wear these all the time and they are easily the most comfortable shirts I own. So again, go to darrenvandam.com slash shop to go check out those new designs. But let's talk about the rest of the sci-fi movies on Prime. Charlie Sheen stars in my next pick and it's a wildly underrated movie of his titled The Arrival. Now this is an alien invasion movie, but I love the way this one plays out. It too plays out much more like a mystery movie, especially during the first half. And it does feel a bit dated. It's a 90s alien invasion movie. There's nothing mind blowing going on here, but it does hold up surprisingly well, mainly because of how unique and interesting the take is on an alien invasion. There's not many other movies that do it this way. And again, The Arrival just has a bunch of surprises in it, even for a dated movie from the 90s. My number 14 pick is the only movie on this list that is a Prime Video original. And personally, I think it's one of the coolest Prime Video originals they have released so far even though for some reason a lot of people didn't seem to like the Tomorrow War. Now I will say some of the sci-fi elements, particularly the time travel elements in this movie, I thought were kind of silly and not very well delivered. However, it does serve as an interesting delivery device for putting the main characters into the future where they're having to fight these aliens that have essentially taken over the entire planet. And that's where I think this movie really excels is at being a monster movie. It's much less about time travel and all the science fiction-y things you see in the trailers and much more about killing these giant alien monsters that you do not get a great glimpse at in the trailers, but they actually kept the look of these monsters under wraps when this movie released, which led to a fantastic moment when you see them for the first time. I know this movie was originally supposed to come out in theaters, but when you frame this as a straight to streaming or a Prime Video original movie, it is a dynamite action adventure flick. Next up, I've got a sci-fi flick from the same writer-director as the recently released The Creator that was just out in theaters recently. And while I did like it, it's a fairly slow-paced sci-fi flick, I will say it has a lot in common with his first movie, Monsters. This too is a fairly slow paced movie. There's not a lot of big effects. There's certainly no action sequences and just like the creator, you would really hesitate to call either an action movie. This is almost more of a road flick. You follow two main characters who are going on this journey in a world inhabited by these gigantic monsters, almost Godzilla sized monsters. But instead of watching them destroy cities in monsters, you're actually just existing in the world and literally trying to hide and evade from these gigantic monsters. So it's a much more different take, but the filmmaking here really puts you in the position of these characters and you ultimately do get to see some monsters. You just don't want to go into this movie expecting that because I know you'll be sorely disappointed. Next up, we've got a sci-fi horror gem from 1995 that was actually based on a story written by Philip K. Dick and the screenplay was written by Dan O'Bannon who is most famous for screenwriting Alien. And on top of that, it stars sci-fi legend Peter Weller in Screamers. Now this takes place on a distant planet. You actually follow mostly military people who are combating these screamers, these little machines that run underneath the surface of the ground and kill you. Basically killer drones before we really had a good idea of how killer drones might work. 
Now the concept and the writing for Screamers is fantastic. It really kind of holds up and could easily be remade today and be a killer flick. But the look and feel of Screamers is 100% 1995 and I love this movie for that. The effects are outdated in a great way. The costumes look almost silly in a very 1995 kind of way. But that now slightly cheesy veneer is on top of a solid horror sci-fi flick that is well worth watching today. Now I've said the phrase low budget multiple times on this list so far, which again is not something that really typically works with science fiction. You kind of need that production value for effects and the setting and everything, but my next pick was filmed for the cinematic equivalent of pocket change, coherence. Now there might be a few actors you recognize here, but for the most part, this takes place at a dinner party. It was filmed very down and dirty. It looks like it was filmed with a flip phone practically, but the story is so gripping that it landed in the middle of a list full of fantastic movies. This dinner party actually occurs as a comet is passing Earth, and the people at the party begin to notice strange things happening. Now, that's really all I wanna tell you, but as you can tell from the clips here, there's nothing overtly science fiction visually. It's all done with the storytelling, and it's so tight and so complex. It's almost a Christopher Nolan level sci-fi flick, just not with the filmmaking technique that you might expect from Nolan. However, the down and dirty filmmaking here actually makes coherence feel even more realistic than I think it otherwise would have. Okay, my next pick on this list is another low budget effort, but it did such an amazing job with world building that I desperately hope we get to see a sequel to Freaks. You gotta be strong like your mom was. You know my mom? <laughs> Now the concept for this one can be pretty off-putting too, especially from the very beginning of the movie. Emil Hirsch plays this kind of crazed father who's keeping his young daughter locked up in a dilapidated house. But the reason why is fascinating and the road to understanding why is really well done in Freaks. Now there are some special effects that work really well and there are some that I don't think work very well at all in Freaks, but the core story and everything works so well that I don't mind at all. This is a really cool flick. It's got some dark, twisted elements, but again, nothing too off-putting. This is a fairly accessible flick. Bruce Dern has a really kind of creepy but cool role in this as well. And like I said, the world building for a movie done at this budget level is just kind of unmatched. It's pretty fantastic. If we don't get a sequel, this is something that could also just turn into a series on Prime Video or Netflix or something. All right, now we're going to dial the clock all the way back to 1983 with one of the most legendary actors of all time doing one of his most legendary performances, Christopher Walken in The Dead Zone. Now this is based on a book by Stephen King, and even though it wasn't one of his more popular movies during that era, I think it has held up better than a lot of older Stephen King movies have. Christopher Walken plays a man who awakens from a coma and discovers he has this new ability to predict or at least see the future when something bad is going to happen. And the movie is top-notch stuff. It was actually directed by David Cronenberg before he really went in some bizarre directions in the 80s, actually making it one of his more accessible movies. This movie also led to what might be Christopher Walken's second best Saturday Night Live sketch. You're gonna get an ice cream headache. <laughs> It's gonna hurt real bad. <laughs> right here. My number eight pick is a big budget new release that I absolutely loved, A Quiet Place Part Two. Now, I was a fan of the original. I don't care about some of the plot holes. I love the way John Krasinski actually directed that movie and thought it was just a top-notch thriller horror movie. Hadn't seen anything quite like it since M. Night Shyamalan first started making movies. And part two was an excellent follow-up. It takes place in the same world. It feels very much like a part two and not just a sequel where they're trying to recapture the magic of the original. And the story actually just continues on seamlessly in a way that I thought was just absolutely killer. 
Emily Blunt carries the movie. She's really amazing in it, but the introduction of Killian Murphy in this movie was particularly good, and it just has some harrowing sequences in it. I think both of those movies are fantastic, and we've got another one that is actually somewhat of a prequel on the way next year. My number seven pick kind of feels like a 1980s after school special with a high body count and a lot of blood. Turbo Kid takes place in a dystopian, post-apocalyptic future, but instead of a Mad Max type movie, you get something that almost feels like it was made for children, and then when the violence kicks in, it is just this bloody, over-the-top, glorious mess that I absolutely love. It's got this retro synth wave soundtrack that's really cool. Duels to the death, lasers, saw blades, cowboys, it's got almost everything you could want, and it's jammed together in a way that actually works. It's humorous, but also has plenty of tension, and you're rooting for the main characters. It's not just silly nonsense. If you're the least bit interested in the vibe that I'm describing and showing you here, Turbo Kid is a total gem. But at the same time, if you don't feel like you'll connect with it, maybe because of when you were born, um, I'm not sure if Turbo Kid is gonna be the movie for you. All right, now we're in my top six, and Rudger Hauer has got a flick that has been on Prime Video, I think since I started reviewing movies <laughs> on YouTube, and it is still there, and I still highly recommend Split Second. Now, this is one that time has largely forgotten, but it too is kind of a bloody sci-fi horror flick. This takes place in a future where London is essentially flooded. They kind of set it up where most of the city is flooded and then you ultimately don't see a whole lot of it. The vehicles are just driving around in shallow water, but it's in the future. They've got massive guns and they're investigating a murder or a series of murders that appear to have this cult type vibe. Rudger Hauer is just a badass. He's got this cartoonish kind of look in the movie that is just totally cool. Kim Cattrall has a pretty meaty role in this back when she was young, well before Sex in the City. And there is something very wicked at work in this movie. This is not just a murder investigation movie. There is a science fiction element and it gets revealed and it is a wild one. But unlike Turbo Kid, which is fun and colorful when it's bloody, uh, Split Second can be pretty gross and disturbing at times, but if you want to watch a sci-fi horror movie with gigantic guns and just a badass Rudger Hauer and something super sinister behind the scenes, then Split Second is going to be right up your alley. Then my next pick, all the way from 1953, one of the most classic drive-in sci-fi movies of all time, War of the Worlds. Now, obviously, there have been remakes of this movie, some terrible. Spielberg did one that I thought was pretty decent, but the original movie still holds up today as a really cool 1950s flick. Right from the jump, it looks and feels like a classic drive-in movie. It's been remastered. It looks incredible today. And the action in it, when they're fighting the aliens, yes, it looks like a 1950s movie, but it's super cool and it's all glued together really well, making it a fantastic rewatch here in 2023. And yes, even though it's essentially a war movie and there's a relatively high body count, the movie itself is non-graphic, it's rated G, meaning this could make a good family watch, especially as a good way to introduce your kids to what movies used to be like. War of the Worlds is still a great one. And then my number four pick is easily one of the most visually stunning sci-fi movies I've seen in the past few years, maybe second to Avatar, Valerian in the City of a Thousand Planets. This is actually directed by Luke Besson, who's most famous for Leon the Professional, La Femme Nikita, but he also did The Fifth Element, and this movie has a lot in common with The Fifth Element. One being, there's a lot of stuff in this movie that doesn't work. I would say the same thing about The Fifth Element. There's some sloppy elements, but he's able to make up for a lot of that with the visual style. And I say style, I don't say storytelling. The storytelling here is pretty good, but the visual ride that they take you on is, again, maybe topped by the most recent Avatar movie. It really is a visual feast from scene to scene. 
He keeps putting you in wildly different worlds, and there's always something interesting going on. Overall, the movie is not just a total banger. I don't love the story. It's just kind of okay. But the experience of watching it is just kind of unbelievable. And really, even though it flopped at the box office, I think deserves a lot more. Number two pick for the best sci-fi movies on Prime Video right now was one of my favorite movies of 2022, Jordan Peele's Nope. Here we go. I've talked about this movie before, but I loved everything about it. I loved the concept, the delivery. I liked most of the actors in the movie, including the supporting ones like Steven Yen. I thought this is one of his best roles. He put Michael Wincott in the movie. I haven't seen him in anything like since the 90s, so it was cool to see him. I honestly geeked out on everything. I mean, there's two stories. There's a thing with the chimp and then the thing in the sky, both stories. One of them begins with a popping balloon, the other one ends with a popping balloon. I mean, it is tightly written. The themes are all glued together insanely well, but it has plenty of room for humor, amazing performance, and just kind of a visual presentation that is unforgettable to say the least. I do understand why some people didn't like this movie, and I think a lot of it comes down to expectations. So hopefully, if I frame this up with the right expectations, you'll enjoy it at least half as much as I did. And then my number one movie on this list is bound to piss some of you off, but it's animated, and it's one of the best anime movies of all time, making it wildly accessible for a broad audience, Ghost in the Shell. Now the way I do these lists, I find all the movies first and then I go about sorting them and I could not not put this movie at the top of the list. It is absolutely incredible and it doesn't matter if you like anime, if you've never seen it, you don't understand anything about it, you don't need to. All you need to know is that the filmmakers decided to animate this movie instead of filming it and when you watch it there are obvious reasons why, mainly because when this came out there was no way to convey a story visually this way on film. It would have been insanely expensive. So back then you would have to animate something like this. I mean, the remake they made with Scarlett Johansson is okay. I like it and then visually it looks good, but it doesn't come close to looking as good as the animation style does in the original. And this is one of only a few anime movies I would actually recommend as being like your first one to watch. So if you've never gotten into it, and even if you don't have a desire to get into anime, you just want to watch a good sci-fi flick, Ghost in the Shell is a fantastic way to go. But that is the list. Don't forget to go check out DarrenVanDam.com if you want to see all the new t-shirt designs over there. But I will keep making videos as long as you keep watching them. Thanks for checking out this special sci-fi episode, and you will see me on the next one.